here I am again. Um, somehow I've got to try and sum up almost 30 individual presentations. As diverse in nature, it initially seems, as the people that gave those presentations. Presentations, in actual fact, that spread from Sweden to Romania. Uh, and with uh, quite a good sprinkling, in actual fact, um, from the Scandinavian countries, uh, which hitherto have perhaps been not very well represented or very prominent um, in garden archaeology studies. So what we've seen in actual fact is a whole range of sites and site information being presented, but a lot of common features have emerged. And I'm not proposing to go through the individual talks one by one, um, but I will pick out selected highlights. So the contributors are not all garden archaeologists. In fact, the full-time garden archaeologists among us can be counted on one, if not two, fingers. Um, for most people, garden archaeology is just a part of their job. Um, some get their hands dirty. Others are obliged to take the results from people who get their hands dirty. So what we've actually got or have had amongst us over the past few days are not just archaeologists, but architects and landscape architects, garden and property managers, but all share an interest in the results of archaeological endeavour in historic gardens. And most of the projects that, have been, that we've discussed have been of a multidisciplinary nature. Not simply in the way in which the archaeologist has perhaps sat as part of a research and design team, but in themselves, the archaeologists have worked with related specialists, uh, particularly in sort of fields such as the retrieval of archaeobotanical information. Uh, and modern archaeology is very much a collaboration with specialists uh, in a whole range of scientific techniques, ranging from or varying from geophysics all the way through to soil microfabric analysis. And we've had examples or seen examples of all of those. But what I found particularly um, revelatory was that in Scandinavia, some of the archaeobotanical archeo um, identifications have been carried out in the field. And the importance of that, in actual fact, is that it enables strategic sampling to be undertaken. And at the same time, I was very intrigued and, and see some great potential in the way in which soil microfabric analysis um, has helped to characterise areas of former lawn uh, or other grassed areas. The scope of archaeological investigation ranges from the non-invasive to the intrusive, uh, and excavation in actual fact can vary between something that's specially targeted to resolve particular issues, specific is issues, um, as in a Belgian example from Gaswick, um, to the investigation of single structures. And we've seen in a number of instances um, how archaeological investigation has shown an enormous amount of detail relating to the construction of individual pond features um, and to consideration of hydrological matters. In quite a, a few cases, in, in actual fact, sort of demonstrating the rather empirical approach of people in the past. People then, as now, didn't really do more than they were absolutely obliged to. So archaeology is a good way of sort of showing how particular issues may have been resolved, how corners might have been cut, and how practical solutions were arrived at. Um, but at the, at the same time, as looking at individual structures, some work has been more comprehensive. 
and has involved a total or the total clearance of, of a site um, prior to full-scale reconstruction at places like Hampton Court uh, and so on. But it isn't always the gardens of the rich and famous, the gardens of the elite um, that garden archaeologists are involved with. Equally important are the small domestic gardens. Um, equally important are the kitchen gardens and the even smaller individual vegetable plots. Uh, and quite often, in consideration of um, presentations of garden archaeology, they get overlooked, and at least they've had some representation here. And maybe that's an aspect that we could uh, explore in more detail uh, on a future uh, occasion. So the types of excavation range, as I say, from spe specially targeted to sort of something that can be really comprehensive, uh, and an enormous amount of detail can be obtained. At the same time, it's possible to correct earlier mistake or what we now perceive to be as mistaken restoration or reconstruction. And one would hope that perhaps some of the things that we're doing today or have been doing over the past 20 or so years will be revisited by future archaeologists who will castigate us as much as we perhaps sort of uh, uh, bemoan what previous excavators of sites have, have done. So there are a number of examples, um, several from the UK, where modern garden archaeology has sought to rectify inappropriate reconstructions of the past from Kirby Hall and Kenilworth to the grotto at Marble Hill. But at the same time, I was gratified to see that in the Brunitsky Gardens and at Filanov here in Poland, they were similarly correcting mistaken uh, reconstructions. And then there's the wonderful case of the Botanic Garden uh, at, uh, uh, at the site in Sintra, um, where a wonderful garden was, um, was destroyed to make way for a riding area, and that in its turn has been dug up, uh, and features of that botanical garden rediscovered uh, and, and restored. So, as I was saying, types of site can range from small domestic gardens to the much larger gardens and parkland uh, of great country estates. But all the way through, regardless of size, um, the methods of approach, the uh, methods of looking and investigating these landscapes, and often they can be palimpsest landscapes, such as we've seen sort of um, uh, at various sites, uh, including Rest Park, for example, in, in the UK. Um, the, the approach is always the same. It's an informed archeological approach that begins with a critical source analysis um, and no single source, as Roman Martina um, reminded us yesterday, no single source can be wholly trusted and we can use archeology span to corroborate other sources of information just as those sources themselves um, may provide a bit of a check upon some of our wilder speculations um, regarding the information that, uh, that we discover. Aerial surveys are particularly important um, and most particularly sort of in recent years the availability of much LIDAR data and it's becoming increasingly cheaper and easier to obtain aerial information uh, through the use of drones and there's been demonstration of that um, but of course as was made quite clear yesterday it's the quality of the equipment that you're using that will be crit is critical in a lot of a lot of these instances at ground level there's the opportunity in actual fact uh, with the development or the continuing development of integrated mobile mapping techniques to wander through Parkland, for example, uh, and collect an enormous amount of data in a relatively short period of time 
um, that will enable sort of the rapid production or more rapid production than has hitherto been possible of tree inventories uh, and providing enormous amount of information that's essential for future management. In fact, that becomes increasingly important as much of our tree stands become affected or prone to, to loss because of the various effects of, of climate change, which I touched upon partly um, in my own presentation right at the beginning. In fact, it's also a vital tool to help us to restore the kinds of spatial relationships uh, and opening up some of the vistas um, that Renata told us about in relation to the Park Mujakowski uh, on the border between Poland and, and Germany. But more than anything, we can also use a lot of this information obtained by drones from, from the air, uh, obtained by the mobile mapping techniques on the ground to provide 3D reconstructed detail. And again, obviously, the better equi the equipment, the better the results will be. We can also Im integrate geophysical techniques. And the long established magnetometry and resistivity techniques are now greatly aug augmented uh, by quicker and more effective ground penetrating radar techniques. In fact, I've been extremely impressed uh, by the GPR results uh, that we've been shown, uh, both from um, Pernstein Castle uh, in, the, in the Czech Republic. We saw some from Sweden also, uh, and particularly in the presentation that Neil Linford uh, and Thomas Herbig uh, gave yesterday. Yet all of this information needs to be set within um, a, a a common spatial framework, which should be, uh, if you like, an audit uh, or a mapping of all existing detail. In other words, recording the present landscape situation before we do anything else. In fact, that should be the basis of, on which we build all the other, or add all the other information. And that information needs to be properly documented. It needs to be thoroughly assessed, validated, verified. And at the same time, we need to be making that information available, not simply through prompt publication of results, but where we're undertaking work in the field, particularly excavation. Um, it can often be of benefit uh, to people sponsoring the work um, or the encouragement of further work to involve the public through visitor days or in some instances uh, through actually being, to, uh, being able to experience some of that excavation work. At the same time, we can mount exhibitions. Uh, we can provide information uh, through apps and over the internet uh, and, and so on. Um, there are a lot of people here that are more competent in those fields than I can ever pretend to be. But most importantly, we need a fully indexed and cross-referenced archaeological archive in which all this information is integrated, is accessible, is in a form that can be revisited, re-evaluated, um, and at the same time, that documentation should also record the decisions that are taken and show how they've been arrived at. And that's absolutely critical because we look back at previous reconstructions and we scratch our heads. Why did they do that? What on earth made them do that? So let's be fair to future generations and be honest in our own decision making admitting to what we know, what we suspect, and what we've made up. But at the end of the day, archaeology is as much about people as it is about places. And a great British archaeologist, 
of world renown, Sir Mortimer Wheeler, um, adapted a, a, a quotation from, I think it was uh, Ezekiel, the book of Ezekiel, uh, which he said, you know, driest dust, or, or sorry, dry dust, dry bones, is the driest dust that blows. And we're digging up, not pots, not things, we're digging up people. People make places. And that became very evident in Romans, from Roman's contribution, and also Pavel Yaskanis talking about Villeneuve, where gardens are part of a property. From, from the point of view of the original owner of a place, the garden was frequently indivisible from the house. It was a single entity. And quite frequently, what happened in the one was mirrored by some activity in the other. And it isn't always a change in the house that makes a change in the gardens. Sometimes things can happen in the garden that will alter the arrangements within a house, whereby different rooms might, be, um, might come into use so that particular views could be appreciated. The property, or a person's view about the property, may be a reflection of their status. They may, may use it as a propaganda uh, for their prestige. They may develop, as at Villeneuve, museums that have an educational value, where people can come and they can learn about sort of uh, uh, Greek vases and, and things like that, whatever turns you on. But at the same time, they are a reflection of the owner's cleverness. So it's still another part of the individual's projection of themselves. And as we, as we were also reminded, there are important links between different families and different family members. Things change upon marriage. Things change with the death of an owner uh, and the inheritance by others who may have very, very different ideas. And all of this can be reflected in the gardens. In my own contribution, I talked about short-lived gardens being quite good for excavation because they're largely sort of showing a, a single episode. But we've also seen multi-phase sites, and they require a slightly different approach um, in terms of, um, uh, of their presentation. Uh, and I was very impressed by some of the work that's been undertaken in Italy, um, where without really restoring the garden as such, an impression of parts of the, of, of the former layout can be created through careful planting, selective planting, uh, and various sort of grass mowing regimes. In fact, that's something that I've, I've tried in, in the UK um, with a fair degree of success in the wilderness area at Hampton Court Palace, which is renowned for its spring flowers of daffodils and, and, um, uh, and, and other plants. But once they're over, it's a, a very sort of tawdry part of the, of the gardens. So with a, a team a few years ago, I actually laid out the lines of labyrinths and, and other features that had um, been a part of that wilderness area at the end of the 17th and early years of the 18th century. And the grass is mown uh, and these shapes become, more ev become evident over the summer months, so that people can at least get an inkling of what that layout may have been like. So we don't actually have to physically reconstruct something to give an impression of what it was like. But clearly we do need to communicate what we're doing uh, and, and why that is, that is the case. So we can turn now, I think, to sort of perhaps discussing what should be going on, or what the next steps might be here. 
uh, in Christopher, but also I'd like in the discussion to raise the subject of the potential for future gatherings like this and maybe we can consider some topics that we would like to discuss. I don't think we necessarily want an annual event, but perhaps sort of some biennial event every couple of years um, would be appropriate uh, and we can come together and we can share not merely our enthusiasms, but also our continuing and growing experiences. So that's all I want to really sort of say in summing up. They were my impressions. Probably you're all going away with something completely different in your mind and thinking, gosh, where's he been for the past couple of days? Um, but anyway, I, I did stay awake, I think. <laughs> so now there's the opportunity, as I say, for some discussion uh, and you know, perhaps we should begin with considering the sort of the next steps um, that should be taken here. Uh, we've heard quite a lot about the, the garden. We've been out into the garden itself. Um, in order to manage the discussion properly uh, and so that everybody or the contributions that individuals are making can be filmed, it's important if you want to sort of to say anything not simply to sort of to indicate that you want to say something, but in due course to come to the front uh, and to take up a microphone uh, so that you can be recorded. So, what do we do here next? I, I could, I've got some ideas, but I'm sure you've all got ideas as well based upon your own experience. And rather than me, dominating the conversation. I'd like somebody else to have something to say, please. Hello. Yes, we, the Swedish part, we have uh, come together to a decision that we are going to go far north, uh, far up, uh, to the people who really decide <clears throat> it's the university, we, have, we lack education, we have uh, the ones who are deciding with uh, the protection of the gardens and also the government, Statens Fastidsverk, who owns a lot of uh, buildings with gardens. So we just decided this morning that we are, our further step is that we will make a program yeah. where we are going to uh, tell what we believe is important <laughs> and uh, take uh, uh, important people with us and to tell them you have to do like this. Yeah. Okay. And here we have good examples and we had a nice conference, conference in Poland behind us and so we are going to discuss further after this conference. Excellent. Yeah. I, I, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> <laughs> Has anybody else got sort of a comment to make? I either like that as to what their, what their next steps are going to be or what the next steps ought to be here in relation to the castle garden itself that we've been considering. John. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning. Um, in addition to uh, the first contribution, I think we also... Um, uh, my experience of a number of projects is that there are a number of people we need to bring with us in creating change and any change that's created here over time is actually going to change things for the local community it's going to bring hopefully in some ways many more thousands of people here that's going to impact on on the residents impact on uh, local accommodation a whole range of other things so um, uh, what is needed is a lot of regular communication so that all these groups move together and forward at the same time. And it may be um, um, starting off with visioning exercises. You know, what might we dream it to be in 20 years? And then um, reaching an agreement of what that dream might be some things will be realistic, unrealistic, but we have to start with the unrealistic, I always believe. 
um, what might that vision be and get an agreement, a general agreement amongst the, uh, the academics, the professionals, the economists, and also the local people, and then working out what are those steps to achieve that, and, um, and what other things might we want to get out of that relating to skills, education, jobs, employment, uh, and, and all of those things. And it's through that sort of master planning process uh, the, um, macro um, and micro that you can then have a, a sensible uh, way forward. Fine. Thank you, John. Is there anybody else that would like to sort of uh, comment either along those lines or something similar or something completely different? Thank you. Uh, I think many things you have already uh, told, um, speak about it, but uh, um, uh, looking at the future of this place, I think we have to think about uh, uh, the next future, but also um, with a long-term vision. So what is the target? What is the audience we can reach with the restoration of this place? I think the local people is important, also, with uh, um, this uh, suggestion we have uh, um, just uh, uh, heard about, about uh, uh, the, the, the involvement of the population, but also looking at an international audience. Um, this place, is, I think, is special for Poland. Um, it's special for its uh, structure, for its history. Um, it's a ruin at the moment, but uh, it's just an element of a big complex. Perhaps we have also to think about the, the complex, the, the system uh, that the castle belongs. So also the garden, of course, but also the agrarian landscape around in the enhancement of this place. And uh, um, thinking about the future of the castle, of this system, um, I think uh, we have to to answer uh, also to a bigger question. What, what could be the management of this place? Um, so, uh, yes, we now our efforts are on the um, reconstruction, parcel reconstruction of the place, but uh, we have also to manage it during the time. And uh, looking at uh, also the international consideration, uh, what about, for example, UNESCO? Uh, the criteria of UNESCO are uh, integrity and uh, authenticity. So, uh, if uh, we want to achieve also an international audience, we have to look to, to, to think about these uh, criteria, they are important. So, um, the reconstruction, perhaps, as you have said, um, is uh, we, 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 we have to think about also other kind of reconstruction, uh, the evocation, the, um, uh, just the, the communication of some, um, some layers of, uh, of the place. Um, and uh, um, yes, I, I think it, the, so the, 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 my, my, my suggestion is uh, to to think about uh, uh, the, the, the extraordinary events we can have in just in a moment in the, during the work, but also in the future with the, the management of the place. Good. Thank you. Are there any other comments of a general nature or a specific nature? Yes. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, just uh, very short, because I'm not an archaeologist, so I'm an, I'm an engineer. Sorry. Well, that's, that's fine. <laughs> and very, very well. Just, <laughs> just uh, well, I'm a surveyor, and my concern sometimes is that uh, sometimes when people ask to us, I want to map mm. the site. And mapping up to now, it means nothing. Mm. You have so several technologies, so one suggestion is consider that there is a, a different approach to surveying, mm -hmm. 
One is to support some works you have to plan, or just for digital uh, documentation. Yes. Okay, and this is not an easy topic uh, in my my side. And uh, also, why I tell you this? Because I would suggest uh, why not to create uh, a, a scientific committee, okay? Mm -hmm. Just a selection of the people you have here, yeah. or I don't know, the criteria, where you have uh, all these competencies and where you have the, on, on daily basis, not, not, not say daily, but <laughs> on uh, constant uh, base, to have a discussion about the topics we have been discussing here. Yeah. That, that, that's a very good point that I was going to come to, but uh, I'm quite happy to move towards that. Um, now, uh, uh, anybody else wants to sort of say anything before I go off at a bit of a tangent? Yes. Funktioniert das? Yeah. Okay. Um. This star of stage and screen. Thank you. Um, I would like to show you uh, this picture. Um, maybe a little bit, it's a similar situation like, like here, uh, the castle is um, demolished. Uh, the Renaissance garden is only alone and uh, the local people are very proud for the result of this pro um, project. We finished it last year. Uh, it's a virtually reconstruction of this Renaissance garden. And it was possible because um, the gardener, um, he was over 30 years active in this garden during the 17th century. Um, he wrote um, a book, he described this garden, and also Matthias Merian um, painted uh, some views of this garden. And um, I, I told you the local people are very proud and many tourists are visiting uh, for this uh, performance. Yes, I mean, there are, there are many different ways of, of presenting historic gardens, which again is something that we can come on to. Um, yeah, Move yes, to the main camera. Okay. <laughs> Dzień dobry. E, bardzo się cieszę, że ta konferencja miała miejsce, dlatego że w tej naszej interdyscyplinarności podkreśliliśmy obecność zwykłych ludzi na koniec jako odbiorców naszej pracy. Mówię to z perspektywy muzealnej, ale także to jest perspektywa każdego, kto się opiekuje zabytkiem. Zwłaszcza takimi, które oddziałują bardzo mocno na świadomość, na emocje. Powtarzam, co powiedziałem. Dziękuję, Brian, za to, że zwróciłeś na to uwagę. Ale wydaje mi się, że kolejne nasze spotkania powinny być poświęcone tak. Z jednej strony metodyce badań, co tutaj padło, bardzo specyficznym podejściom metodycznym. Dziękuję za te słowa ze Skandynawii, zwłaszcza dotyczące palinologii czy paleobotaniki w ogóle, jako czegoś, co ma bardzo duży odbiór społeczny i coraz bardziej rosnące zainteresowanie, no bo każdy jest ogrodnikiem. Nie jest to instynkt atawistyczny, ale taka też potrzeba i estetyczna i coraz bardziej życia ekologicznego. Wiemy z gospodarki rolnej, która jest naprawdę bardzo uprzemysłowiona, niezdrowa dla naszego życia, że ludzie coraz bardziej się odwracają od tego przemysłu i szukają własnych ścieżek, dobranych do ich potrzeb, chociażby zdrowotnych. No to wracamy w ten sposób do XVII wieku, do jedzenia humoralnego. Nie wiem, jak to się da przetłumaczyć, ale to było powszechne w Europie. Humoralne to znaczy, jaki typ człowiek reprezentuje fizjologiczno, intelektualno, psychiczny. Do tego były dobierane posty, do tego były dobierane rodzaje jedzenia, czyli świadome jedzenie, no dworskie oczywiście, czyli w tych bogatych miejscach. My o tym w muzeum mówimy, uczymy, staramy się uczyć, mimo że jest to dopiero początek drogi. Ekologia i żywność to jest zaledwie z tego, co wiemy, około 5-7% w ogóle gospodarki żywieniowej. Powinniśmy w tą stronę pójść. Pewnie w Skandynawii więcej, oczywiście. Po to, żeby wytłumaczyć za pomocą archeologii, jak zdrowo jeść. I tutaj wracam do materii, do zabytków, takich chociażby jak Krzysztopur. To są świetne miejsca do prezentacji tego rodzaju problemów. 
oddziaływania na wiedzę, emocje i budowania mechanizmów biznesowych, ekonomicznych. To trzeba na przykładzie tego miejsca, czy też miejsc takich, jakie Państwo pokazywali w czasie konferencji, porozmawiać także o stronie ekonomicznej, o tych modelach, o relacjach społecznych, bo wtedy archeologia będzie miała najwięcej sensu, bo inwestorzy będą patrzyli na naszą pracę jako zbędne koszty. A jak jeszcze ktoś będzie mówił, że trzeba przeprowadzić bardzo specjalistyczne badania dotyczące organicznych, jakichś specyficznych elementów pozostałości tego, co kiedyś uprawiano, hodowano, jedzono, no to żaden decydent powie, nie, mamy tutaj przemysł wielki, spożywczy, nie będziemy się bawili w drobiazgi dotyczące specyficznego jedzenia kiedyś na przykład. Mówię to z doświadczenia też Wilanowskiego, bo to jest stały problem. Przebijamy się przez to, więc róbmy to razem. To jest moja zachęta. Dlatego zapraszam do Wilanowa, żebyśmy mogli tego też zasmakować. Czyli od ogrodu, poprzez badania ogrodu, do kuchni, którą można też samemu uprawiać podczas warsztatów, aż do spróbowania. I wtedy przy stole możemy rozmawiać o specyfice zagospodarowania tego typu miejsc. Patrzę na mapę Krzysztoporu. I widzę problem zagospodarowania otoczenia, nie samego zamku. Chcemy go ochronić, to chronimy go tylko i wyłącznie wtedy, kiedy zagospodarujemy otoczenie. Bo inaczej wszystko, co na co dzień w takim biznesie turystycznym będzie się pchało do środka. I zniszczy ten zabytek i jego wartości. Konieczna jest tutaj otulina krajobrazowa, badania krajobrazowe, wielkoprzestrzenne. Archeologia krajobrazu jest niezbędna także. Mówię tutaj jakby za Michel Foucault, który użył archeologii jako pojęcia zupełnie zasadniczego do roz odkładania tych warstw kolejnych w zasadzie w każdym aspekcie życia codziennego. A ogrody są naprawdę znacznie bardziej spektakularne, bo oddziaływują na zmysły, bardziej spektakularne niż sam zabytek. Mamy mocne narzędzie. Dziękuję. Well, that's, that's truly building upon the past. <laughs> so we've brought ourselves back to the situation here. Um, we've talked a little bit, or a mention has been made of the creation of a scientific council. Yep. I can't see part of the room because of, of, there's a very bright light there. <laughs> uh, good morning and uh, thank you very much. I just wanted to add that... Um, a bit, bit further on. Co coming from a country where garden archaeology is just beginning, uh, I think that more publicity should be made, not on a national but international uh, basis. And the principles of garden archaeology, the the means you can do garden archaeology, the importance of doing garden archaeology, should be emphasized on, the, on an international scale. So either a charter of garden archaeology or adding to the existing documents, such as the Florence Charter or the European Landscape Convention, can help this. Uh, um, this process go go further and in this kind of documents maybe state that um, uh, archaeobotany is uh, it's a very important tool because many or I'm speaking for my own country I don't think uh, my, uh, my fellow countrymen know much about uh, uh, archaeobotany and why is it important why is it important to dig only this deep and not deeper in, in gardens, why it is important to have all the uh, strata. I, I know there is a difference now between layers and uh, strata. Why, why are all these important? And why are all these important for the conservation and for the restoration and in, in uh, certain cases for the reconstructions of gardens? So I see that in many countries, uh, information about garden archaeology and all the related subjects is known on different scales but in others is not. So I think that should be emphasized and uh, more publicity should be made in this uh, respect. I think, and sorry for <laughs> that's, that's, that's fine. I, I think that's a, a very good point. And um, one hopes that in due course, the publication of these papers will help to a certain extent 
though of course they're going to be rather specialised and they'll be rather technical and somewhat off-putting to the general reader, I'd have thought. But who knows? Um, but I think it, it is incumbent upon us to share the fruits of our research um, as widely as possible uh, and to couch that information in terms that most people can understand rather than hiding behind um, acronyms and some very, very technical words which I'm sure have challenged our translators over the past couple of days. So thank you very much for coping with, uh, with what, what we've been saying. Renata? Renata comes with her own microphone, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Słyszeli Państwo na, na początku naszej konferencji, Pani Dyrektor o tym e, mówiła, e, że e, nasza instytucja, Narodowy Instytut Dziedzictwa, która odziedziczyła e, e, dorobek poprzedzających jej instytucji, Ośrodka Ochrony Zabytkowego Krajobrazu i, i Krajowego Ośrodka Badań Dokumentacji Zabytku. Nasza instytucja ma duży dorobek w, w dziedzinie archeologii okrodowej, ale też wkład w rozpowszechnianiu tych, tej metody badań. Naszym zadaniem od kilku lat jest też propagowanie wśród badaczy, projektantów, a szczególnie wśród służb konserwatorskich, wśród wojewódzkich konserwatorów zabytków w całej Polsce dobrych praktyk i pewnych, no, dawanie im pewnych rekomendacji, jak postępować z ogrodami zabytkowymi. I archeologia ogrodowa jest kolejnym zagadnieniem, które mogłoby być przedmiotem takich rekomendacji. Będziemy starali się opracować te rekomendacje, no jakby zestandaryzować pewne działania w ogrodach historycznych, właśnie badawcze, archeologiczno-ogrodowe, dlatego że w wyniku, w wyniku popularyzacji w tym pierwszym okresie archeologia, jakby ta metoda dotarła do wielu odbiorców i zaczęło to ją stosować w bardzo wielu obiektach w sposób, który przynosił różne rezultaty i też metodycznie była w bardzo różny sposób realizowana. Czasami bardzo kontrowersyjny. Chcielibyśmy wobec tego prosić Państwa o pomoc współpracować z Państwem, abyśmy mogli we właściwy sposób te rekomendacje opracować i rozpowszechnić. Dziękuję. Thank you, thank you, Renata. Um, I'd like to call on John Watkins to perhaps say a few words about that, because John, through English heritage, has for many years been working on a draft, guidelines, uh, conservation principles for historic gardens. Sorry, John, for dropping you in, but uh, I think it's appropriate that you say a few words. Yes, um, I, I shouldn't have told uh, Brian. Um, so, yeah, well, I've heard um, about it for years. Yes, um, well, one document that we've been working on for many years, and uh, a colleague of mine and a friend who's just retired after after, um, uh, I think, uh, what would it be, 24 years at English Heritage and, and, uh, and Historic England. Um, um, I first employed her to um, pr produce documentation so that we could publish conservation principles for design landscapes. Our challenge was being, uh, being one organization that um, it was conservation, building, uh, conservation principles for the historic environment, which was heavily weighted to the built environment, was the, the core concept that was our focus. 
And because we were following on that, we had to um, be up to date with the latest version. And um, uh, I, I'm, I'm proud to say that we are now um, going through uh, an internal review of the English, with the English Heritage Trust, where, where we are about to publish um, after 25 years of uh, discussion, um, conservation principles for, for design landscape. Um, and, um, and, in, uh, and we're doing this in two documents. The first document is, is the guidance. Um, and a lot of it is, is, is a discussion and a way of looking and a way of thinking um, and interpreting. Because I, I, I believe that actually it's good to have a core way of thinking for the historic environment and then to interpret that with different specialisms. And that's what we're trying, we're trying to do. We then, for our own organization, um, will, will have our strategy of the things that we will deliver over the next five years. Um, that's positive for me because if I'm getting my organization to sign up to um, our strategy going ahead, um, which is then put in my forward job plan, they need to fund it so that I can deliver my job. <laughs> so um, that's the plan, but don't tell anybody. Um, so um, uh, that's what we, we, we're working on. And I, I, and I think um, uh, also... Gosh, it would be about 12 years ago we produ um, I produced a book on, um, on um, uh, a handbook on um, managing uh, historic uh, landscapes and gardens, and, um, I, which, which is now out, um, out of print. Um, but I think a lot of people found that useful um, because a lot of people actually don't know what to do. So if you can give people basic advice on um, even the simpler simplest things of um, how to get a landscape contractor, how to write a brief for an archaeologist. Um, what are the, you know, how can I do things right? You know, we should help all the people that want to do things right and give them very easy steps on, on how to, to do that. And, um, uh, and I think once people have dealt with the, the basics, then, we can, then you can start to sort of rift yes. on um, the different ways of, um, of doing it and being creative. Thank you. Thank you, John. I think that was very, very useful and um, clarifies a, a lot of points and uh, I think a lot of thinking too. Um, and obviously sort of we need to walk before we can run. That's the right way around, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so we crawl, we crawl before we walk, and we walk before we run, yeah. So we mustn't sort of run away with some of our enthusiasms too quickly. Um, I like the idea of there sort of being a, a scientific council to sort of to consider future steps. Um, but going back to sort of a point that John made sort of right at the beginning, there does need to be this sort of vision in exercise um, involving all the sort of sta the stakeholders but in particular the major stakeholders um, need to perhaps have their hands held a little bit um, so that they can sort of begin to sort of to see something of the future uh, rather than maybe some quite wild fantastic ideas which could be extremely expensive to to realize and once realized may be virtually impossible to maintain. Um, so I think it's, it is very much a question of step by step, one thing at a time, uh, and the move towards the creation of a scientific council, I think is an important early step. Um, on some practical matters, uh, if we look at this historic plan uh, it raises all sorts of questions in that it, it was made some years after the sort of the, uh, the castle had been sacked. Uh, it shows uh, a remarkable, a remarkably detailed rather, uh, embroidered pattern in the parterre, uh, which we don't know is whether that really existed uh, or whether that's sort of simply a design that's been put in to fill the space. There does appear to be some mirror symmetry in it. But the interesting thing is that this plan is presumably based upon an earlier existing survey. 
uh, and in my cups yesterday evening, after that wonderful meal, and uh, I was chatting with some of our Scandinavian colleagues, and an interesting suggestion was made. And would you like to elaborate upon it, please? Whoever. This is a little like a wild idea, and uh, it might be a wild goose chase, as you say, in England. Uh, but uh, I was wondering, because there has been um, digitization of uh, quite a lot of old sketches of Dahlberg, for example, uh, from the, six, the war archives from the 17th century. And there is quite a lot uh, actually preserved. And, the sketches are, of course, more detailed, like more close to reality, because they first made sketches on site most of the time, but then the printing was done in Holland usually or Netherlands. Or, yeah, so they were sent away and some, then they came back. And so there is a style uh, to consider in these, in these images. Uh, but we could, uh, we should just ask the archives to help us look through, just in case, perhaps, maybe, there are some more sketches or, that are closer to reality. I don't even know if you have already done this, but that would be a really good thing to do as well. And I, I, I think I was led to understand that there's a possibility there could even be a survey, because quite a, quite a lot of this material um, isn't indexed. Uh, and so it might involve somebody having a trip to Stockholm to spend a couple of days going through the archives. <laughs> a suggestion. Has anybody got any other points that they, they wish to make? Well, I touched very briefly upon the, the possibility of, of us having a, a, another conference. Um, perhaps in, in a couple of years' time. A suggestion has been made that there could, it could deal with methodological issues. Um, another suggestion could be that it, it could deal with how we represent historic gardens. You know, we've talked about garden reconstruction. That's been very much at the fore in this particular um, conference, but there are other ways, and we've seen a gl had a glimpse of them uh, in one or two of our contributions over the past couple of days. There are other ways uh, of demonstrating what historic gardens were like. There are particular challenges with multi-phase, if you like, palimpsest um, types of garden, uh, and that is another a topic that we could we could consider. So is there a general feeling that in addition to the bonhomie and camaraderie um, and the benefits of out of formal session chats and drinks um, that you know, we could have sort of something a little more formal on either of those topics? And has anybody got any other suggestions for potential topics? Hello, John. Um, I think one other thing to, to consider with a property like this is, is, is other uses. Um, one of the advantages here is there's, there's a huge amount of wide-ranging studies over many years that can contribute to our understanding of this place, but also helping to guide and train people that will then go and look at other places. So um, some, in, in a master plan, some of the things that will be worth looking at is um, what could the role of a place like this in being a place of study, or part of it being a place of study. Could there be um, some uh, uh, accommodation provided here for um, um, so that people could be stay here for a week, um, study and undertake archaeology or even uh, uh, garden studies, um, repair of masonry. Um, uh, at English Heritage, we've just got a major 
uh, grant that, that is enabling us over five years to develop apprenticeships um, for, um, uh, that will lead to a bigger population um, of people who can repair flinty ruins. And so um, that is, um, is developing a sort of training school to deliver that. Um, could there be the, the potential for something like this? It, other advantages, could it would be providing local employment um, and could help other sort of uh, local pensions as well. So that there's a sort of wider thing to consider. Thank you, John. Um, yes, I mean, that's been um, operated successfully over a number of years at Banfi Castle, Bonsida in, uh, in Romania. Um, and in actual fact, there was a, the vestiges of a landscape park there as well, um, which has also been sort of partially investigated. Um, but this idea of training schools um, and involving the sort of the, 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 the wider and the local community together, uh, I think is a, a, ve a very important one. But above all, and I'm preaching to the converted here, much of the work that we've been looking at over the past couple of days has been the result of an endeavour where the archaeologist has been embedded into a, a project team. Um, and it's important that if a scientific council is established here, that there is adequate proper archaeological representation on that. Um, and I'm sure that one of the first things that that scientific council should be looking to achieve is some form of spatial analysis to provide the context and a base of information upon which and into which all subsequent investigations of whatever nature they might be um, can be fitted. So I think that step by step, that really is the sort of the first, first step for to think in terms of bringing about some scientific council that can then work in conjunction with the local people, the local councillors, the local authority um, to envision what should be happening here and where we should be going. Has anybody got any further comments before I pass over to Renata? But I would like to say beforehand, just beforehand, that you're going to be brief. Dziękuję, Brian. Drodzy Państwo, wczorajsze wieczorne rozmowy były bardzo ważne. Nie wszystko to, o czym rozmawialiśmy, zostało tu dzisiaj powiedziane, więc ja pozwolę sobie dopowiedzieć pewne rzeczy. Jeśli chodzi o ogrody i o tą najbliższą przyszłość, bo tu padały słuszne sugestie, że trzeba pracować, wypracować, powołać. To zabiera czas. Niektóre działania musimy podjąć już. W związku z tym mogę Państwu powiedzieć, że ze strony właściciela i organizatorów tego przedsięwzięcia no, jest ustalony pewien plan, że i po to zresztą Państwo się tu pojawili, żeby przedstawić swoje doświadczenia, że zostaną podjęte wysiłki, aby przeprowadzić jeszcze zanim zapadną decyzje, badania nieinwazyjne, że na tym terenie pojawią się geofizycy, że ten teren otrzyma odpowiednią prospekcję z powietrza, że wykorzystane zostaną wszystkie najnowsze technologie do rozczytania tego terenu. Mało tego, to co podkreślał Brian, a co jest niezmiernie ważne, co podkreślał profesor Wesenna że ważna jest inwentaryzacja tego, co ma być przedmiotem przyszłych badań. Więc w tym pierwszym okresie, zanim spotkamy się ponownie i będziemy rozmawiali, podejrzewam, że pojawimy się już my, gospodarze, jeśli mogę w liczbie mnogiej to tak określać, tego terenu z pakietem informacji, być może już z uzupełnioną kwerendą źródeł, być może korzystając z życzliwości szwedzkich kolegów. 
że może wtedy już ten obraz będzie jaśniejszy i ten kierunek, któryśmy sobie obrali. Ja wczoraj rozmawiałem ze wszystkimi, wszyscy się zgadzają co do jednego, że w przypadku e, ogrodów e, musimy wejść w swojego rodzaju rekonstrukcję, która stworzy e, e, pełne dopełnienie treści. Każda perła musi mieć swoją oprawę. Tą oprawą w przypadku Krzysztoporu są ogrody i jego otoczenie. Więc na tym będziemy koncentrowali swoje wysiłki. To będzie nasz główny punkt działania, w którym mam nadzieję, że w dalszym ciągu Państwo wezmą udział, czy to przy okazji dyskusji przy następnym spotkaniu, czy w jakiejkolwiek innej formie, bo każdy z nas ma już ze sobą nawiązany kontakt, więc ja sądzę, że ten kontakt zostanie utrzymany. I jako, że powoli zbliżamy się do końca, ja pozwolę sobie, bo najważniejsze słowa padają na końcu, nie na, nie na początku, e, e, powiedzieć jeszcze kilka słów na temat e, tej konferencji, idei tej konferencji. E, jak wiecie Państwo, ta konferencja miała swój e, e, naukowy komitet, tak to nazwijmy. W jego skład wchodził Brian Dix, Gerd Wenckier i ja. I proszę mi wierzyć, że gdyby nie wysiłek Briana i Gerta, to pewnie bym spasował. Także dziękuję Wam bardzo za wysiłek i za to, że wspólnym wysiłkiem udało nam się osiągnąć to, co stało się tutaj w Krzysztoporze przez te trzy dni. Państwu serdecznie dziękuję za udział. E, nigdy w najśmieszszych snach nie wyobrażałem sobie, że e, zbierze się grupa, która przedstawi praktycznie bez wyjątku znakomite referaty. To było duże przeżycie. Sądzę, że to jest ważny rozdział w historii archeologii ogrodowej. Jeśli uda nam się przy życzliwości Narodowego Instytutu opublikować te materiały w sposób właściwy, godny zabytkowych ogrodów, to wszyscy będą mieli z tego pożytek. Sądzę, że teraz takie ostatnie słowo. Renato, bardzo Cię proszę, jeśli mogę wywołać. Chyba, że Ty, Brian, coś. Okay. Yeah. Just before we hand over to Renata, I would like to thank you all for your attendance and for giving such splendid presentations. Thank you. I na koniec chciałabym Państwa zaprosić na miły akcent w postaci e, krótkiej prezentacji, e, na którą zgodził się e, za moją e, namową profesor Afelt, który chciałby Państwu przedstawić taki bardzo ciekawy problem. Dzień dobry Państwu. To wielka przyjemność przedstawić fragment e, moich przeżyć dość daleko stąd. Nie dotyczą one ogrodów, a dotyczą ogródków. I ich ogrodnikami są gospodynie domowe dość daleko stąd. W Japonii, w prefekturze Okajama, do której należy również niewielka wyspa na wewnętrznym morzu Seto. Ta wyspa zaznaczona jest na mapie jako malutka, malutka kropeczka, ponieważ jest w rzeczywistości niewielka. Ma 0,54 km2 powierzchni i 3,4 km obwodu. W rzeczywistości jest to zespół pięciu wysp, ale tylko ta największa jest zamieszkana i ma długą historię. To jest człowiek, który przywrócił świadomość istnienia tej wyspy i tego, co na niej się znajduje światu. Japoński artysta konceptualny, rzeźbiarz, zdjęcie z Seulu z roku 2016, gdzie wyłożył swoją koncepcję rewitalizacji totalnej tej wyspy. Zaczęło się to wszystko w 1995 roku. Od tego czasu zrealizowano i realizuje się piąty projekt. 
najważniejszym projektem artysty Jana Giego było zbudowanie muzeum na terenie poprzemysłowym. Był to teren byłej rafinerii miedzi, która działała w latach 1909-1919. Muzeum zawiera wielką atrakcję. Sześć instalacji Jana Giego wykonanych z elementów domu, w którym Yukio Mishima, słynny pisarz japoński, napisał swoją pierwszą wielką powieść, która go upowszechniła w świecie. To są elementy jego pokoju. Jego pokój miał wymiary 2,5 tatami, czyli 180 cm na 2,70 ale nie o tym będę mówił. Kolejnym przedsięwzięciem był projekt domów galerii, które zostały zrealizowane w miejscu opuszczonych siedlisk ludzi. W czasie istnienia rafinerii miedzi wyspę zamieszkiwało 6 tysięcy osób. Dzisiaj mieszka na niej 28 osób, Średni wiek przekroczył 90 lat. Te nowe galerie powstały w miejscu trzech opuszczonych domów z wykorzystaniem elementów budowlanych tych domów. Do tych domów przylegały opuszczone ogródki. Te ogródki zostały rekultywowane raz w ramach projektu architektonicznego, Dwa, przy pomocy mieszkańców, sąsiadów, którzy tam mieszkają. Zgodnie z filozofią tego projektu, ta nieliczna garstka mieszkańców bierze udział we wszystkich działaniach artystycznych na wyspie. To jest otwarcie nowej instalacji w największym budynku galeryjnym, gdzie artysta... Yy, opowiada tymi słowami o swoich dziełach. Drewno wykorzystane i inspiracja z lokalnych ogródków. Zasadzanie roślin przez mieszkańców w otoczeniu galerii i projekt zasadniczy, o którym chcę powiedzieć, to przedsięwzięcie przedostatnie Inujima Botanic Life Garden. Znajduje się to w tym miejscu. Ma 4,5 tysiąca metrów kwadratowych powierzchni. Teren został zakupiony przez fundatora całości projektu, którym jest multimiliarder japoński. Działa nad tym projektem botanicznego ogrodu firma architektury krajobrazu zatrudnieniem stałym ogrodnika. To jest orientacyjny plan, jednakże troszkę inaczej realizowany. Wszystko ma zastosowanie dydaktyczne, ponieważ jedną z idei, którą projekt realizuje, jest pokazanie możliwości zeroenergetycznego budynku i cyrkulacji mediów naturalnych w naturze. Ogrodnik, który zasadza rośliny pobrane z ogrodów tej ludności, która tam jeszcze mieszka, ale też z innych, do których można wejść. Nie ma tu aranżacji projektowanej. Poszczególne rośliny zasadzane są w wymaganym przez biologię odstępie od już zasadzonych. Budynkiem królującym w tym rejonie jest cieplarnia. Cieplarnia przechowuje rośliny pobrane z domost, a właściwie przekazane przez panie domu. Jest to rozmnażane i można nabyć rozsadę.
ale najnowszą i najbardziej popularną działalnością jest oferta gastronomiczna. Ponieważ w ogrodzie produkuje się niewielkie, miniaturowe ilości warzyw, które są typowe i endemiczne w tym miejscu, można powiedzieć, że uprawiane nie tylko od stu lat, ale historia tej wyspy sięga XV wieku, gdzie tam mieszkali piraci, być może do tych czasów pirackich to sięga. Dziełem artystycznym jest ten kiosk z blachy, repulsowanej. No i oczywiście oferta gastronomiczna. Tak naprawdę mówiąc, najmłodsze pokolenie najbardziej jest podniecone kurami. Kury zna z FFKC, a tu można kurę zobaczyć, mało tego, dotknąć. Te kury są udomowione i chodzą swobodzie, chociaż mają wolierę, która chroni je w nocy przed drapieżnikami, które tu też zamieszkują. I to jest, proszę Państwa, marzenie każdego, kto odwiedza wyspę. Skosztować tego, co wyrosło tutaj, wzięło się z rąk pielęgnujących ogrodniczek i jest niezwykle miniaturowe, bo ten talerzyk ma wielkość spotka pod filiżankę. Jak to porównamy z wczorajszym bankietem? Dziękuję.